Guys, this is Brian. Welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, it seems like uh, everywhere I go, when I walk into the church, I have this Louisville slugger, and every time, not just once in a while, every time someone says, wow, what's going on here today? Um, and the thought is, I guess you never really know. You know God's going to be here, right? Um, and we believe in prayer, but it never hurts to have a Louisville slugger. So I'll refer to that um, in just a minute. But Pastor Sarah, thank you. Um, obviously got to connect with her a lot. Pastor Tim, thank you, and your wife, uh, Melody. Um, I want to give a big shout out. I know that people are watching online today to Jean, uh, who kind of does a lot of work with your missions program. She's been emailing me. I've uh, and I'll tell it more in my story, but I pastored for 30 years in uh, Reading, GT Church, um, one of our AG churches, and um, the last three years I've been with Teen Challenge. And almost from the very beginning of my start with Teen Challenge, uh, Jean has been interacting with me and said, how can we pray for you? How can we pray for a Teen Challenge, the men and women there? And I just want to tell you how important that is. So Jean, thank you so much if you're watching today. And I know Pastor Tim and his wife have been here nearly five years, and for that entire time, almost, they've been supporting, you've been supporting Teen Challenge, not only prayerfully, but financially. And I just want to give a big thank you and shout out. You are making such an impact. You heard Ryan's story. Uh, he is just one of many um, students, patients that have been helped because of your prayer and because you're giving. So thank you so, so very much. Uh, just a quick update with it, some of the things that are going on. Maybe you're familiar with Teen Challenge, maybe you're not. Um, I will say this, that out at the table, maybe when you leave, uh, there is some information there that you can grab. But Teen Challenge has been a wonderful ministry uh, for over 60 years. You know, uh, David Wilkerson, you maybe know the story, Crossing the Switchblade, 1962. Uh, he went to help gang members. He was pastoring out in Western PA. He went to help gang members up in New York City that were in violent crime and killing each other. And when he was working among them, and he, you, know, talk, you know, Pastor Sarah mentioned about doing something that God calls you to do. Well, that's what God spoke to David Wilkerson about. And so he left that church in Western PA, and he went up uh, to New York City and met with Nikki Cruz and those gang leaders. He realized not only were they violent and troubled and lost, but they had huge addiction problems. And so... Long story short, God directed him, uh, brought those young men back to the thriving metropolis of Raresburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, not even a traffic light in that town. Uh, but there's a huge farm there, and God was there. And, and many of you do know, Teen Challenge now is around the world. The first center was in Raresburg. I'm up there about two, three days a week and on the road to rest. But from there, it has gone around the world. Uh, Jamaica, you name it, overseas, wherever it is, Puerto Rico, uh, teen challenges that are bringing freedom uh, to people so much. And so we're grateful. And uh, we have a detox program there. If you've done any YouTubing or news and you've seen what's going on in Philly uh, in a place called Kensington, it's called Needle Park. It's, it's really one of the saddest places you can go. People around the world know about it uh, because they're using this drug now called Trank. I mean, we've heard of opioids, we've seen fentanyl, we've seen that, but this trank drug is really a, a drug used on horses to, as a tranquilizer, and people are putting this into their bodies. Uh, they walk around Kensington near Philly, they're almost in a zombie state. We're down there four or five days a week doing street ministry. Um, last Thursday, we brought four men back uh, to the program to get medically supervised detox. Then they can stay for 30 days and just get their life straight. And if they choose to, we introduce them to Jesus and they can stay as a part of our discipleship program. And so uh, we serve men and women. I mentioned we brought those men from uh, Kensington, but we serve men and women. And uh, I just want to say to you what a great blessing your prayer and support is to us. So thank you so much. And Gene, all of you that work in missions, uh, I know Pastor Sarah with Outreach, thank you so very much. The last thing I would say about that is that you know, that is a residential campus, so they can come for detox, short-term 30 days, or they can stay for nine months and really get to know who God is, and we do job training if they need a GED. Um, but we also, in the last seven years, there's a Christian counseling group 
it's outpatient, so it's not residential. It's called the Naaman Center. And if you know the Old Testament story of Captain Naaman, who didn't really want to dip himself in the Jordan River, but was completely healed when he obeyed God, uh, the Naaman Center is a Christian um, counseling area where we deal with addiction um, in, in outside of Raresburg. And we have a campus in Pittsburgh that's residential, but we have um, almost a dozen programs, Lebanon County, uh, not so many out here in Shippensburg yet, but we're going to be moving out here at some point, but in the Philly area where people can just come, maybe you've got a son or daughter or loved one that needs to talk to someone about addiction in their life. How many know there's a lot of addiction in our world? And all of us can battle it at some level, whether it's food or drugs or media or you name it. And so uh, the Naaman Center is a great way. Uh, some of the things we value, number one, we value faith, all right? We want to take action because the growth of addiction in our country and around the world is escalating. Um, and we want to be about community. And the Naaman Center really helps us just get out of Raresburg or that campus, but gets into the communities uh, where we're helping communities that are battling drug addiction. I know in the Reading area, there's a huge drug problem there. A few months ago, we had six or seven overdoses in one day because of, quote unquote, bad fentanyl. I didn't know there was good fentanyl, but there was some really bad fentanyl. So it's so sad. Uh, and then excellence. We want to serve God with excellence. And so there's information out there. Uh, if you know someone that needs help, we'd be glad to talk with you. My wife or I, Deb, would be glad to serve you there. If you want to get a newsletter or update, there's information for that. But Pastor Tim, thank you for having us today. And um, we're so, so grateful for your support. Um, I want to say this to the church. I love your vision. I was obviously on your website and I just love the vision of, of this church, seeking Christ, transforming lives, driven by love. And I thought, you know, obviously I'm in a lot of churches, and you, you, know, you want to get familiar before you go and pray before you go, but I just love that. Seeking Christ, what's more important than that, right? Um, transforming lives and driven by love. You know, a lot of people are driven today, but it's not by love. Driven by money, driven by stuff, driven by a number of things, but driven by love. And it made me think of our vision at Teen Challenge. Um, you know, our vision is to bring wholeness to the hopeless. In fact, every day you walk into Wilkerson Hall, the days that I'm up there, on the wall right there, it, it, it's listed right there, it says, hope lives here. Yeah. Hope is found here and transform lives leave here. One of my favorite times at Teen Challenge, in fact, our last graduation I spoke at, it's wonderful to see these men and women that haven't achieved a lot in their life. Maybe they've been bound by addiction for a number of years, and they're taking steps on that journey of recovery. They've found Christ. You know, it's one thing to be sober. It's one thing to be free from drugs, and that's a great thing. But, you know, that still doesn't make you ready for heaven. And so it's wonderful to see them come to know Christ, and they, they graduate, they get that medallion put over. Second Corinthians is on there about becoming a new creation in Christ. They walk across that stage, and they see a wife or a husband or a child or a grandma there, and the smile's as big as can be. And so transform lives is really what it's all about. So again, I've said it about 18 times, and maybe I need to say it 18 more. Thank you for praying for us. Thank you for your support. Um, well, let me do this. We're going to go into the message. I'm going to talk today about life's difficulties. And as I think about Teen Challenge, you know, there's things we deal with in life that are rough. And how many know that sometimes it was our choice that, that caused it? Right? We have a free choice. I used to say when I pastored for years, we have the freedom to make our choices, but then our choices make us. Then there are things that happen in life that it really isn't our choice. It wasn't our fault. It wasn't what we decided to do. It's just something that happened to us. Someone hurt us. Someone abused us. Someone divorced us. Someone broke their promise to us. That wasn't our choice. That's just part of living in a fallen world. And so we make some bad choices. People around us do. And I want to talk to you today about what do we do in those moments of life when life's difficulties come our way? Uh, let me ask this. How many t today here, Chip, you believe... Um, in numbers, you believe numbers are important? Raise your hand. All right, maybe five of us. Probably if you think numbers are important, you pay the bills online for sure. Uh, it could be your birthday soon or maybe an anniversary. And if you forget an anniversary, I would just say this. Um, someone may want to borrow the Louisville Slugger. I'm just saying. 
No, they don't, because you're driven by love. I understand that. But numbers are important, right? Um, there's an entire book of the Bible called Numbers. One of the things I've said for so many years is this, is that every number has a name. And I want to say this. Here at Shippensburg first, you're not a number. You're watching online today. You're not a number. I don't know how many people are here. I don't know how many kids are here. I know we met Mary, who's teaching first and second graders. God bless her for that. But every number has a name, and every name has a story, and every story matters to God. Amen. And so I'm going to share some of my life story with you today, but I, as I do that, I want you to think about your life story, because we all have one. I, I love, one of my favorite things is having conversations and hearing people's life story, hearing their testimony. One of the joys I get of serving at Teen Challenge, nearly every day that I'm in that office, a student comes by, and I'll grab him and I'll say, hey, uh, just give me five minutes. Give me five minutes. Tell me your story. And they tell me where are they from and tell me how they were raised and tell me how they got addicted to drugs and how God directed them, even before they knew it, to Teen Challenge. And I love that. And so as I share some of my story today, I know that you have a story. My wife has a story. She's got a lot of heartbreak in her life and has had a tough journey. And so we serve a redemptive God. You know, the accident that I went through happened over nine years ago. And she's gone through a lot, and God, in his redemptions, brought us together to live life, not alone, but together. So God is good. Amen? Amen. And there, there's pain in life, as it was said here today. It's not always easy. The worship today was powerful. It reminds us, is life easy? Is it always, you know, man, I, I, I found Christ, and now everything's fine? No, not always. But I want you to think about that. There are some challenging and difficult times in our life. And the message I want to share with you today is, I'm all right. I'm all right. And I think it's good for us to know sometimes in the Christian faith that being all right's all right. Hey, listen, in the miraculous, I believe in the miraculous. I'm standing here as a miracle today. Many of you maybe even prayed for me. You heard of my story, and, you know, when we were hitting the motorcycle and you prayed, and people will come to me almost everywhere I go and say, we prayed for you nine years ago, and I say thank you, and I mean it sincerely I don't think I'd be here without those prayers. The doctors told my boys, they said, we don't think, your mom's already passed, we don't know if your dad's going to make it. But I want to tell you right now, there's power in prayer. Amen. But it's okay to be all right. And, I, you know, I get through life with prayer and certainly reading the word, but how many know laughter does the heart good like medicine? And one night I was sitting there with my boys and we were talking, and when you hear my story, I lost my left eye, I lost my left leg, lost the wedding band off my, my hand, and mother of my boys was killed, and I said to the boys, I said, you know, I'm all right because I don't have much left on the left. Some of you are going to get that today when you're at Kentucky Fried Chicken or wherever you're going. Uh, but it's okay to be all right because when you have Christ, you're more than all right. You're ready for eternity. Amen. All right? And so, um, you know, like I said, we've got information back there. I've got a book back there. It's called I'm All Right. I'm going to share that message with you today. Uh, this book has been known to heal insomnia, so if you are having trouble sleeping at night, you start reading it, man, bam, God will use it and just put you right out. But uh, <laughs> so grateful, we are so grateful to be with you here today. I'm usually an expository preacher, and I go through a chapter, uh, but today we're going to bounce around a little bit, so online or here, wherever, grab your Bible, uh, your phone, your iPad, whatever you use. And I'm first going to turn to Isaiah 26.3, one of the most powerful verses in my life, especially in life's difficulties. And the prophet Isaiah says this, God speaks through him, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. I love that. I love like your vision, driven by love, fixed. So it's not just, oh, a passing thought. It's almost like when Jesus went to Jerusalem, he was just set on going to Jerusalem. It's like fixed. His thoughts are fixed. And here's what I want to say to you. We will be all right in life anytime, but certainly in life difficulties, physical, relational problems, we will be all right when we fix our thoughts on God. Amen. Now, does that cure everything? Does that make it just go easy? No, there, there's still the struggle. There's still the pain. There's still the heartache. But, you know, people used to say to me when I pastor, they'd say, Pastor, how do people that don't know God, how do they do this? 
The rain falls on the just and the unjust. Cancer affects everybody. Divorce can affect Christians, non-Christians. Things can happen. And I often said, I don't know how they do it because sometimes, listen, right? Like Pastor Sarah said, being transparent. We're being honest. It's not easy day, you know, some days when you know Christ. I don't know how people do it that don't know God. But as we fix our thoughts on God, as we fix our thoughts on his word, those promises that we sang about today, they're going to bring encouragement to us. We fix our thoughts, it's going to help our family. When we fix our thoughts on God, it's going to help our ministry. I mean, thank God for this church. Thank God for the outreach. The fair, are you kidding me? There's food, prayer, and Jesus. Does it get better than that? That's awesome. You guys have your thoughts fixed on the will of God. So ministry, and certainly when we're going through hard times, that passage, that scripture, like Isaiah 26, 3 means something to me, you have your verse. Maybe it's a life verse. Maybe it's a verse God gave you. I mean, even as you read Romans 8, probably one of the most powerful chapters in the Bible. Is everything that happens to us good? No, but God can work it together for good. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. So we got to fix our thoughts. And how many know your thought life is a big deal? I heard Pastor Tim say it, maybe in the prayer time even, like, you talk about, you know, the most powerful, uh, you know, organ in your body for addiction, for life. It's your brain. It's your thinking. It's your heart. And when we're in life's difficulties, there's a lot of challenges that happen to say, is God even up there? Does God remember who I am? Like, does he even know what's going on? Yes, he does. Think of how many conversations you have with yourself every day. You say, well, I don't do that. I don't talk to myself. That's what, you know, no. We, listen, how many conversations do we have with ourselves every day? Now, if you're talking out loud and really being vocal, men, maybe we need to talk to you. But, uh, but you have all these conversations that go on in your mind. And when you're in those hard times, it's even more. I've said, it's not wrong to question God. I, you know, I'm riding that motorcycle and the... Uh, my first wife, Lynn, mother of our boys is on the back. We're a mile from our house. We get hit. And I thought, when I woke up 51 days later in a coma, out of a coma, she's already been buried. She's been dead for, you know, almost two months. I, can I honestly tell you, as I opened my eyes, what the first things I said? And I really knew what happened because I really didn't know what happened. I didn't even know I had lost my leg. I said, why, God? It's not wrong to say why. It's not wrong to ask God Why? but you can't live there. If you live there wondering and asking God, then that's going to take you in a different place. Someone mentioned the word lament today. I want to tell you, if you read your Bible, there is a group of psalms called the lament psalms. And you, King David, you know, Asaph, all the writers of the psalms are saying, you know, well, Psalm 73 is a great example. God is good. God is good to Israel, Asaph says. That's our orientation. God is good. Okay? But as for me, well, time out. God's good, but as for me, I think he's forgotten me. That's disorientation. And then the reorientation, Asaph says in Psalm 73, when I walked into the sanctuary of God, then I realized the end of the wicked. Reorientation. So life isn't always easy. But when we fix our thoughts on God and we're reminded by the promises in his word, Romans 8, Psalm 73, Isaiah 26, then God says, you know what? I've got you. I've got you. All right? So it's not wrong to question God. It's just wrong to live there. And in fact, I used to say to myself, if God really answered us, like you really wanted, like I thought about that one day, because I did. I questioned God. I said, God, one more red light. If we'd, have, if we'd have went 30 more seconds in the restroom or ate our ice cream a little bit longer, we'd have missed that drunk driver, because that's ultimately what happened. I'm on the Harley Davidson and get hit by a drunk driver head on. One more second, we'd have been on a straight stretch. We hit him on the worst curve on that road. The, the state of Pennsylvania has been sued seven times over it. One more second. So our thinking is so important. I think of Job, like Job had some questions, you know, why God? And God answered Job. But you know, I think if we really knew the answer, I don't know that it would really help us. I really don't. We've got to trust God, like Pastor Sarah said. Proverbs 23, seven says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. As you and I think in our heart, that's the kind of people we are. 
When I played baseball, a lot of guys that were talented, a lot of guys that were really good, but you know what was really bad? Their attitude. Your attitude will determine your altitude. And so the Bible says a man thinks so he is in his heart. That's the way he'll be. So we need to keep our thoughts fixed on God. So the Louisville Slugger, all right? We all know, we know what that is. It's a baseball bat. So I want you to think about it. And as so I tell the story, you know, I always say, I, years ago I would talk about there's things that happen in life above the line, good things. You know, you get married, you graduate, you have a party, it's your birthday, wow. And then there's things that happen below the line. Somebody dies, you get a diagnosis, it's not a good word. But this Louisville slugger was really all about my life. I didn't grow up in church. Um, I, you know, I... I say it, and it's the truth. I grew up early in life. Jesus Christ was a curse word to me. That's it. Um, I was a CEO. Maybe you'd say, what's that? Christmas and Easter only. But sometimes. We didn't always even go Christmas and Easter. But I wasn't an atheist. It wasn't like I didn't believe that there was a God. I, I thought about God like Abraham Lincoln. Like if you saw a picture, you know, the 16th president, I know he existed. I didn't think God, I, didn't, I wasn't an atheist. I thought, well, there is no God. But I just didn't know God personally. I didn't know Abraham Lincoln personally. I know of him, but I don't know him. But you can know God personally. And that's powerful. So I grew up not knowing that. And so I, it was all about baseball. It was always about that. As I got older, I started experimenting with drugs and alcohol. All right, there's different, different levels of addiction. Um, there's binging or just the weekend or before the football game or, well, I played football. I didn't do it before the football game, but I probably after the football game. But, you know, um, and then there's different levels of it. So I was already, as a, as a high school student, getting involved in that a little bit, but I had to stay good enough that I could play baseball because that was what my passion was, right? And one day I was walking through the library at um, high school and there was a cute girl there sitting at the table and I thought, you know what, Brian? you really do need to study more. You need to spend more time in the library. You could see, you know. So I sat at her table, and she was a cute girl, and I talked for a while, and I realized she was more than cute. You know what she really was? She was a Christian. And she started witnessing to me in the library. And I thought, well, she's really cute. I'm going to listen. And then her dad, here's a good parenting skill for you. Her dad, who was a teacher at that same high school, knew me. He saw the skull ring in my back pocket, he knew that I wasn't always what I should be. And he, he, not at school, but later, they had me up for dinner. And uh, he said, Brian, he said, here's the deal. He said, if you want to see our daughter, there's only one place you can see her. And I said, okay. And he, I said, where's that? He goes, church. And they went to the church of the Nazarene. I, I see you have one right here in Chippensburg. We passed it today. Uh, well, I didn't know what the church of the Nazarene was. In fact, where I lived, it was either Catholic or Lutheran, and if it was different, I thought that was weird, and uh, the longer I said it, Church of the Nazarene, it just sounded weird, but you know, it sounded like the Branch Davidians or something like that, and, <laughs> but I thought, she's cute, so I'm going to go, and I went on a Tuesday night, they were having revival services on a Tuesday night, so I met, we went, and I mean, the guy was preaching the word of God, I had never seen it, uh, I'd never been in church that way. Lutheran church, you kneel, you stand up. I'm not knocking the Lutherans because my heart was dark and I wasn't open to the word of God. And so he is preaching the word of God that night and I felt something, I didn't even know what it was. It was called conviction. We're singing this hymn and I'm in a full sweat and you know, I'm thinking, men's this thing gonna be over? But I felt like drawn. He called people up to the altar and before I know it, I'm up on the altar on my knees praying to God. And they prayed for me, and I didn't know, I didn't know anything. Now, first Corinthians, that's first Carnations. You know, Malachi, that, I'd have said, that's Malachi. I, I didn't know. I barely knew Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But that night at the altar, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. The Jarvis family drove me home, dropped me off at the house. I went in the house, and again, I told you, I had gotten in some trouble and whatever. And so I come home on a Tuesday night at 11 o'clock, Wake my mom up. She's a light sleeper. She comes out. She says, Brian Cuck, where in the world were you? It's a school night, and where were you? She, I said, Mom, I was at church. She goes, I'm going to ask you one more time. <laughs> and she goes, if you don't get up, I'm going to get your dad up. I said, Mom, I was in church. And I gave my life to Jesus Christ, and I don't really know what that means. But I did. And my mom, who grew up in North Carolina in a Baptist church, she knew Jesus Christ. 
She'd accepted him into her heart, but she'd strayed from him. And I will never forget it. My mom dropped to her knees, and she hugged me around my legs, and she said, Brian, I've tried to be a good mother to you, but she goes, the most important thing you've needed, I've not given you. And my mom recommitted her life to Christ on the kitchen floor at 11 o'clock on a Tuesday night. Now, I'd get into my dad's story, but you've got to get to the fair tonight, and we wouldn't have time. But my dad wasn't so happy about it. He thought it was going to mess up my career. Now I'm going to church three nights a week, Wednesday night, Sunday night. And you're going again? What are you going again for? You forget what they told you on Sunday? I said, well, I guess we do, Dad, yeah. You might want to stop by sometime and hear it. But I'll tell you this, my dad has come to Christ, and he's a man of God and serves him now. So I thank God. So that was an above-the-line moment. That was 1981. Next year, 1982, I'm a senior. I'm graduating from Muhlenberg. I graduate on a Thursday night. Good thing. I didn't know if I wouldn't make it, but I did graduate above the line. The next day was the MLB draft. And I uh, just recently had it now, but I was uh, that night sitting by the phone. You know, the Cardinals, the Toronto Blue Jays. I was set to go to Arizona State to play, but I really didn't want to go there because you got to study more in the school, and I just want to play baseball. Well, the Chicago White Sox called about, you know, 11 o'clock at night, late, and said, Brian, congratulations, you've been drafted by the Chicago White Sox, and we'd like to fly a guy in tomorrow to talk to you and get you to sign your contract. Well, my dad was my agent, and I don't always recommend that. I don't think your dad should be your agent, you know. But graduate Thursday, drafted by the White Sox Friday, Saturday, I signed my contract. 18 years of age, Monday, I'm in spring training. Extended spring training with the rookie team. And I was like, okay. So I was really thrilled about that. I ended up playing three and a half years with them. Uh, I love baseball. I was a catcher. Uh, and so in my, my third year with them, I'm up in New York playing in the York Penn League. And you know how baseball is. There's always um, the signals and whatever. And so the manager in the dugout gives me the signal. And back in, when I played in the early 80s, the wiggling of the thumb, that was the signal to throw a bean ball. Anybody in here know what a bean ball is? Raise your hand if you know what a bean ball is. Okay, some of you do. For those of you that don't, it's when you intentionally throw a baseball at another player. Like if you do that in Shippensburg, it's called assault, and you'll get arrested for it. You know, they can arrest you for that. But in baseball, it's part of the game. Well, now I'm a Christian. I've got about 10 seconds, not even that, to make a decision. So I'm going to give this same signal to the pitcher, and he's going to hit this kid intentionally with a ball because he hit a home run off of us in the second inning. And I decided not to do it. I don't see why I went to do that. I gave fastball inside, like way inside, because I didn't want to get in trouble. But sure enough, the manager came flying out of the dugout. He was cursing me up and down. Because that, just that um, spring training, I went to the big leagues. I was up there for two days. Carlton Fisk got hurt. They took me up to catch the bullpen. And so that was a really high moment in my life. And he said, Brian, he said, what happened? What, why didn't you call the signal? I said, well, I don't know. I why do we have to do that? He said, because I told you. And he said, if you ever want to get back to the big leagues again, you better do what you're told. Now hit the kid. And he runs back in the dugout. You know how they put the glove over their mouth? and, and We weren't being televised. He should have shoved a glove in his mouth because he was just being really whatever. Well, the next pitch, they hit the kid. So I come up you know, about three innings later. And now they retaliate because the pitchers don't hit. And this young kid on the mound from the Chicago Cubs throws it behind my head. Not here, not here. He didn't just hit me. He threw it and probably didn't know what he was doing. He throws it here, and you're just not used to going like that. So I, I mean forward, so I lean back, and the ball comes up, hits me directly in the face. A 90-mile-an-hour fastball in my left eye. It hit me so direct that my cheekbone wasn't broke, my forehead wasn't broke. It hit me square in the eye. I took about two steps toward first base and fell back. I was never unconscious, but I just knew this. My eye is swollen up. Uh, it was swollen shut for six months. They flew me to Chicago, and they tried to you know, work with me. And, and uh, he just said, finally, in fact, the guy that worked on me um, worked on Sugar Ray Leonard. And he reattached his retina when he got thumbed with a boxing glove. And he said, Brian, he said, your retina is not detached. It's mangled. He said, so there's nothing I can do for you. And that ended my career. And I don't see out of this eye today, very little. Um, that was a tough time. Life can change real quickly. When the doctor says, I can't help you. When the lawyer says, well, he filed for divorce. 
when you've asked the person in your family, you know, don't do that to me anymore. I, that's not right. That anger, you know, just things can happen like that. Well, fast forward, you know, um, I did end up answering the call of God. I didn't even know what being a pastor was. I went, to, I went to Bible school. I went to a Christian school. I took a coaching job there. We had chapel because it was, it was, what do you know? It was the Church of the Nazarene. It was Mount Vernon University in Mount Vernon, Ohio. And we had chapel three days a week, and a speaker was there one day, and he said, if you'll let him, God will use you. And I, I really didn't know what I wanted to be. I was in accounting writing numbers in little green boxes. I thought, I don't really want to do that. I just need a job. I want to, you know, I want to play baseball. And so I thought, well, maybe God wants to use me. And long story short, God did call me. I ended up leaving that school. I went to Bible college. I was ready to graduate. I was a senior. But I thought, I just need to go. I know this is... And so I went to Bible school and uh, ended up leaving Bible school and then getting in ministry. And I, like I said, I pastored GT Church for 33 years. And so I thank God for it. And about nine years ago uh, is when the accident happened. Uh, it It was a Sunday morning like this. We were doing a first responder service where we had first responders that Uh, detectives, police, EMTs, you know it, 911 operators, and we thank them for serving our community and being a part of human government. And so we had a great day, and uh, it's a normal day. We left, and later we just said, hey, maybe we'll get on the motorcycle and go for ice cream. Our oldest son um, was getting ready to have a baby. Uh, He and his wife, who was on our staff, they were getting ready to have a baby in October. My middle son was getting ready to get married. He was engaged in our Youngest was a senior in high school, and on our way home, so I want you to think of the Louisville Slugger now as a set of handlebars. We're driving home from there on that Sunday afternoon about 6 o'clock on this really bad turn that I mentioned earlier, about a mile from our house, and we say this at Teen Challenge. We say addiction isn't prejudice. Opioids, marijuana, heroin, fentanyl, trank, they don't care who you are. If you take it, you're going to get bound by it. Even if you don't take it, we're not, addiction's not prejudice, it affects all of us. It affects our community. You know, whether it's alcohol, whether it's drugs, whatever it is. So we're driving home this beautiful day, it was a great day, and we're going around that curve, and this guy who had a Gatorade bottle this tall, full of vodka in the back seat, and was on prescription medication that he was ripping off prescriptions from doctors, I don't know how he was getting it, but he hit us head on, head on, and, and totally changed my life. Um, I had a big Harley, so it had the pack in the back, so Lynn was instantly killed. Her neck, neck was snapped. She was killed instantly, which I didn't know till later. He hit us on the left side, so my leg was nearly amputated at the site. They barely could get it on the stretcher with me, and they were almost trying to reattach it type thing. Um, it was horrible. And you think, how am I ever going to get through that? Psalm 77, verse 19 says this. Israel is ready to cross the Red Sea. They're in a tough spot. Think about that. You're facing the Red Sea, and behind you is Pharaoh, one of the biggest armies in the world. How many know that's a pretty tough spot? And you've run away from him. In fact, that was the sermon I preached Six or seven months later, when I came back to GT for the first time, we were in a series called Epic, and we were taking the epic stories of the Bible. The week before, a couple of weeks before, it was the three Hebrew children, and my three boys were sitting in the service wondering if their dad was ever going to live. But here's what Psalm 77, 19 says, Your road led through the sea, your pathway through the mighty waters, a pathway no one knew was there. I don't know what you're facing today. I know what Ryan was facing. He said if he didn't get off the streets, he'd be dead. But God made a way. Brian Cuck was lost, didn't know God. It was all about baseball, all about this. And God said, no, Brian, go this way. I don't know what you're facing today. I don't know the news you've gotten today. Maybe some of those worship songs that we sang were really touched you, but I want to tell you, God has a way for you. God has a road for you that... No one knows is even there. In fact, it won't be on your GPS. It won't be like recomputing. You know, there's, that's not going to happen because that road's not even there. But God says, I've got you in this. Sarah, I don't know what road's in front of you or what God's called you to do, but he does. And he's going to lead you like you've said. 
We will be all right because when God brings us to it, he will bring us through it. Will it be perfect? Will it be the same way? No, it's a new season. God brought Deb through some really tough stuff. It's powerful. There are times when God fixes it in our lives. Listen, I believe in the miraculous. I talk to amputees all the time, people with diabetes, people that lost their leg, some of the surgeons that did the 19 surgeries on me, two busted hips, a crushed pelvis, um, all kinds of stuff. They call me and say, Brian, hey, there's a person, they're going to have their leg removed tomorrow. Can you come and talk to them? I said, sure. Sure, if I, I'll, I'll gladly come there. So I believe in the miraculous. One guy said to me, well, Brian, where's the miracle? He said, man, wife got killed. You lost your left leg. Where's the miracle in that? I said, the miracle is that I'm standing here talking to you. Yeah. I mean, there are days I wake up and say, man, I get hit on head on by a drunk driver on a Harley Davidson, and that didn't take me to heaven. God, what's going to take me? Don't worry about it. I got it figured out. The miracle is I'm standing here and even know what my name is still. Did God fix it for Joseph in the Old Testament right away? No. 36 years in a prison, falsely accused. Jeremiah, Isaiah, the prophets. No, some of them got cut in half. John the Baptist, did God fix it right away for John the Baptist? No, he had his head removed. Talk about an amputee. Dear God. Did he fix it for Jesus? Jesus said, let this cup pass for me. But nevertheless, not my will. Jesus suffered and died. He had a road for Moses, and he got him across. So, you know, I lost my hair early on. I'm glad that wasn't just, I'm glad it went right down the middle. Uh, you know, that'd be weird if you're just bald on your left side, you know what I'm saying? And all the bald guys said amen. <laughs> lost my left eye, lost my hair, and I thought that was my story. I didn't think about losing my left leg. I'm glad to be working at Teen Challenge because, again, whether you use and you are addicted or whether you're affected by it, Addiction isn't prejudice. So I already told you, you know, 51 days in the hospital, I woke up, I didn't even know Lynn had already been buried. Um, it was a tough day. And I'll, I'll say this to you that, um, you know, waking up and then getting back, I remember getting back in my home, and you remember, you know, three kids and whatever, and now it's just me. And it was tough. I'm an extrovert. You know, you don't realize how much you talk till no one's there. Forgiveness is tough. Maybe someone's hurt you. You know, it's, it's, I say this about forgiveness, and we're getting ready to close, but forgiveness is life-changing, man. I, I, when I heard it that night on a Tuesday night, I had no idea. You understand forgiveness, it's big. You experience it, it changes your life now and forever. But you know what's hard about forgiveness? You know the hardest part is giving it. It's forgiving someone else. Mm -hmm. Psalm 37, the last verse I'll share, 23 through 24, David says this. King David says, The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Not 75%, not every other detail. He delights in every detail of their life. Though they stumble, they will never fall, for the Lord holds them by the hand. So it's a Louisville slugger, all right? It's a set of handlebars. And the last thing is it's a cane. You know, I, I, it's kind of a cool cane. I, I could use this. If I got this fixed up right, I could, you know, it would be. I, I, in fact, someone gave me a uh, cane sword. Have you ever seen a cane sword? It's like the cane, but then the handle pulls out and it's got a sword on it the length of this. In fact, it was a biker group. There's biker church, you know, where they have bikers meet and they have church on a Tuesday night. They drive their bikes there, and they said, you know, Brian, we want to give you this gift, and they gave me this cane, and it was like all wood carved, and I said, oh, thank you so much. She goes, well, that's not done. Keep looking at it. I said, well, yeah, the carving's really nice. She goes, no, pull it out. I pull this sword out. It's, I'm like, well, that could come in handy. <laughs> get this old guy carrying the cane, and then, you know, hey. Um, but I think of this being a cane, and I think of, like, now, you know, waking up. And I'll, I'll never forget, whether it's addiction, whether it's facing a problem, you know sometimes the hardest step to take in that journey? In fact, I'm convinced it's the toughest. 
It's the first one. So I stood at the courtroom, and you get to give a victim's talk. So Judge Bacabella is here. I'm sitting in this little booth. Me, my oldest son, and one other family member got to say it. And then, I don't want to put you on the spot, Tim, but that's, you were where the convict was. Yeah, I, yeah. Well, just imaginary. But I said to Judge Bacabella, I said, can I look right at him? And he said, yeah. I didn't want to talk to the judge. And I said to him, I said, Sean, I said, listen. I said, whether you, because they were going for 20 years. It was his second DUI. The second family he hit, and now removed my leg, killed the mother of my boys. And I said, whether you get four minutes in prison or four weeks or 40 years, you've given me a life sentence. My boys are going to live the rest of their life without their mom. The grandkids are never going to know her by face. And I said, I'm going to live with one leg. But I said, I choose today, as hard as it is, we forgive you. Because God's forgiven us. And my son said the same thing, and it's tough to genuinely mean it. That doesn't mean you don't think about it. You know, every day I strap this leg on, I think about, man, the choice he made affected my life. But God works it all together for good. But every day I take that step, every day, you know, before, like, listen, when you get older and you got to go to the restroom at 3 in the morning, the bathroom, it's hard enough on two legs. you got to try it with one. But every step you take, and I, I love what King David says, God delights in every detail of our life. Every detail. And though they stumble, and yeah, there's times as an amputee I stumble. We just were in the airport recently, and I stumbled. Something hit my leg and went right down. Though they stumble, they will never fall, for the Lord holds them by the hand. So yeah, I stumble, and yeah, I fall. But I can tell you right now, God's got my hand. God has been faithful to me, and I'm so grateful for that. In fact, I, I remember like when I got my, um, in fact, when I forgave the young man who did this to our family, I uh, didn't even have my prosthetic leg yet. I was using a walker. And I thought, man, how do you go from being a professional athlete to you could wear a patch over your eye and now one leg? And I remember standing there and like, in fact, when I, 19 surgeries I had, like I, th for months I didn't even stand up. I remember the first day I stood up, like to bear my own weight on my hips and my pelvis. I'll never forget that. And then, uh, you know, went to therapy, went to rehab, learned to try to walk again. Now I'm going to get this leg. And the, the prosthetic group is called Next Step. And they were like, she called me. She was so, she goes, Brian, she was like, I'm glad I got you. She goes, your, your leg is in. I want you, you can come get it. And I said, well, that's cool. Like, you don't think about stuff like that. Like, hey, your leg is in, you know. Like, I put my pants on the night before because I just hang them over my leg. You don't, you don't get to do that, you know. I get to spend more time doing my hair and stuff. <laughs> but she goes, your kneecap is beautiful. Like, who's ever been not listen? Have you ever been told you have a beautiful kneecap? Come on. I really like that guy because I like his kneecaps. Um, and so there's my kneecap right there. You know, that kneecap costs about 65,000 bucks. Wow. Well, I said it should be beautiful. I said it should make espresso or send an email or I should be able to check my whatever I need, pay my bills on my kneecap. But I can tell you, like, taking that step every day has been, it's been a challenge, right? And could God fix it? Yeah, you better believe it. God, we're created in the image of God. God could give me a brand new leg. I believe that with all my heart. He could give me a brand new eye. I'm going to tell you right now, my glorified body, here's what I want. I want a brand new left eye. I want a brand new left leg. The hair, I'm going to pass on that. I think it's way overrated. I kind of like this look. Um, but God is faithful. I want you to stand with me. We're going to close. I don't know um, what you're facing today. I don't know what challenges you have. Or maybe there's a loved one. Maybe today there's a loved one, a student, uh, someone that you know that would need teen challenge, whatever it may be. But I, I want to pray for you right now. And I know this is a praying church. I love what the banners that say here. Pray without ceasing on both sides. I was really moved when I saw that today. And I know we've prayed for people that have needs, but if you do have a need today uh, and you want to come forward for prayer, I know the team, Pastor Sarah, Pastor Tim, others would pray for you. 
Um, but let's pray. God, I, I thank you today. I thank you for First Assembly here at Chippensburg. I thank you for this church. I thank you for what you're doing in this church, God. I thank you for godly, excellent leadership, and I thank you for people that are willing to serve, and not just serve each other, but God, that are willing to serve the community. God, we pray a blessing over that fair. God, I pray there are hundreds of conversations over food, and Jesus, that's what you did. It wasn't always a lecture. It wasn't always a sermon. God, you did it along the path as you walk with people, as you just had conversation, as you interacted. God, most of your ministry was being questioned or being trapped by the Pharisees, so, God, I pray that this outreach goes powerful. In the weeks to come where they spend special services, God, a night that changed my life, I pray that many will be changed in those nights of hope. But, God, if there's someone here today that's going through a battle, they're facing a struggle, a difficulty in their life, God, I just pray that they would feel a willingness to come and maybe just receive prayer today. God, if there's someone here today that doesn't know you, God, maybe they just came. Maybe they're a guest, a visitor. Or maybe, maybe they've been coming for a few weeks and they just really don't know you personally. God, may they learn more about knowing about you and may they know you personally today. And so, God, I just thank you for this church. I thank you for the work that's being done. Thank you for the work you do in all of our lives. And I pray your blessing, peace, and goodness over everyone here today. And if they're watching online today, they're not even here, God. I, God, you know right where they are. And God, distance is no, you can send forth your word and bring healing. You can send your word, God, and open their heart to salvation. So God, have your way here and wherever people may be watching. And I thank you for this in Christ's name.